Okay, hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for actually joining me today and actually reaching out. And finally, we've got our episode on. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to give, me. yes, no problem. I'd like to give our listeners today uh, an introduction about yourself. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from Podmatch. Okay, so listeners, we have Stephen Event today. He here, he had close to two decades of elite level canine training, <gasps> focusing on obedience, aggression control, behavioral modification, protection training, turning potentially killer dogs into loyal family members. Okay, this is interesting. Um, he has since stepped away from the dog world and found passion as a mindset and lifestyle coach, teaching a blueprint of discipline, fitness, nutrition, and mindset development. So Steven, <laughs> My name my name is Nicolette. I'm actually the creator for that podcast called Your Wordless. Read that again. Juxtaposition of your very soul. So, Stephen, how did you find yourself training canine? What was your journey? I mean, I always liked had a passion for dogs growing up. Uh, when I was very young, I ended up getting a dog as, basically as early as I could and quickly realized that I had no idea what I was doing. So through years of sort of being tortured by uh, trying my best to raise a dog with no formal knowledge of how to do it, including going to some local, you know, dog obedience classes, uh, but not really having any success, I came across uh, a company that I ended up later working for in South Carolina um, that I worked alongside for three and a half years and basically fell in love with the process and recognize the difference in the species as a whole when they're actually trained the way that they should be. Really? So <laughs> I then saw like the overall experience that you could have in the bond that you could develop with a dog and recognize the fundamental difference between what this offered and sort of the general narrative that most people view as pet ownership. So and from there it was just, <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't get enough. So it became a lifestyle. Wow. Um, you're actually the first person on my podcast to be talking about training dogs. Like I growing up, I used to have dogs back home as well, back in my hometown. But it's like normal. We, we don't need to tra <laughs> we don't need to train them. It's like, OK, but yeah, they're they're leash. So so they're on leash. So it's 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 bad. So I'd like to understand. Can you walk me through the process of training a dog, like a proper process? Yeah. So, I mean, ideally yeah. speaking, um, this even starts before birth. You know, I got to the point where I was training my, uh, my dogs and then breeding them and then taking the puppies from these trained dogs, which inherently trained easier. It, it passes through the genetic markers. No um, way. <laughs> and then so from there, I'm, I'm influencing their development from day one, including things like teaching them not to jump up and just general dog mannerisms. Uh, and then it just sort of escalates from there. As they're maturing, I'm increasing the formality of the training into basic obedience. By the time they're about four to six months, the expectation increases uh, straight through to advanced obedience around the six to nine month mark where I start gradually extending um, the expectations into long leash and then off leash and basically developing a single command response, regardless of the environment uh, on and off leash. And so when done properly, we basically develop the dogs so that they never learn that they can get away with not listening. And we oh. work it in a process that rewards them heavily for following through uh, and there's a correction base uh, for not responding and this is all sort of dependent on the maturity and age of the dog. So have you ever been given a dog to train which I mean I, I hear you you're 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 training them from when they were puppies so have you ever been asked to train like a mature size dog and well 
um, let's just say the people that they show the, the TV show, they show that these dogs are, are, are lethal or they're, they're, they're dangerous. Like, have you ever been, you know, been asked to train those kind of dogs? Yeah, definitely. I've worked with behavioral modification and aggression control as well. So when I say the explanation from the puppy or even pre-puppy development, uh, this is my ideal. I prefer working with preventative training opposed to corrective mm. training. And this goes straight through into the coaching as well. I mean, anything that we do preventatively is always easier and more yeah. thorough. But of course, that's not always the case. Um, and so I've, I've had exceptional uh, success and, and experience with rehabilitating dogs as well now this comes down to the environment that they're in and then basically being able to be that much more on top of what you're doing because they need to understand that their entire world and the expectations are changing and so often when it comes to aggression for example it typically comes from either a dominant protective nature or a submissive fear-based nature and so ah, yes, yes, establishing which one it's coming from really depicts the trajectory of the training. And, and definitely the dominant protective nature is much easier to rehabilitate because we're just looking to sort of harness something that's already very confident. And if anything, we're looking to reel it in a bit. Whereas when we get into submissive and fear based, now we, we really have to subtly, um, develop their confidence and build trust. And so depending on, you know, what's happened in this dog's life, and even once again, the genetic components that have been passed down, uh, that can be extraordinarily difficult and take up an abundance of patience, knowledge and consistency. Wow. So you touch a little bit about training as well as how that relates to your coaching. So that's actually one of my questions for you. How does dog training actually help develop people? That's one. And number two, uh, I know that you've already shifted your, um, I would say, your career into uh, mindset and coach um, uh, development, coaching development. So how does dog training has helped you shape your coaching program to date? Definitely in many ways. I mean, right off the start, when I was training dogs, I noticed that my clients working with their dogs consistently and doing that process properly were actually able to develop out of things like ADD and anxiety just through some of the dog training programs specifically. So this was nothing to do with human development or lifestyle coaching or mindset development. Uh, this okay. was exclusively just focused on training the dog and inherently it helped develop the people too. Mm. So starting from there uh, and then transitioning into this, I mean, one of the things that really gets in the way of a lot of people when they're looking to develop themselves is that we often think too much. We complicate yes. things too much and we look for things to be perfect before we can proceed. Whereas one of the benefits and one of the beauties of working with dogs is that they don't question in the same way. They're looking at a very <laughs> black and white world. And once we can develop their world to be the ideal sort of format, they fall into place and they thrive. And the reality is when people do this, we do too. You know, if we're able to just sort of step back in many cases from our ego or from our, our past stories, and just focus on what it is that we need to fix in our life, we find that we can really accelerate through it quickly. And so definitely things like behavior modification as a whole and, and developing consistency and, and you know, formal practices um, definitely carry through as well. Because with a dog, there's no day off. And yeah. there's not even a moment off. They are learning at all times. And so they're either training you or you're training them. And with people, you know, once we learn to develop that same program where we are 100% on doing 100%, you know, the best of our capability at all times, this is where we can really see major change in our lives. Okay, let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, you mentioned about people just now. 
why do you think that we can never have a 100% success rate training people as much as we train dogs? I just want to hear it from you. <laughs> Although yeah, I think it's the obvious, from, but yeah. <laughs> free will, right? Yeah, um, like, we have free will and we have the option to choose. And as soon as you have that, you have convoluted concepts, you have misconceived ideas, you have laziness, you have like a, an array of things that play a role and prevent us from being successful in the way that we could be. Um, mm -hmm. And often, you know, right down to once again, which I just touched base on, is that we get stuck in our past stories. And we are so focused on living in the past that our brain doesn't allow us to really release and let go of that past in order to move forward and develop to be the person that we really could and should be. So, I mean, the primary difference between, you know, developing a dog and a human developing themselves really does come down to that, that free will. And, and, you know, if we could, if we could manipulate that in order to give the people what they want without giving them the choice of failure, which is really what we're looking to develop through discipline. Um, that's where, once again, we get to see the success and see those monumental gains and rewards that people are really striving for and wanting. So would you, would you be able to break down, like, what are these, these key things that, that people need if they were to, they were to maybe, okay, say number one, scenario one, enroll in your program. Or number two, perhaps just start, just start, just a simple start. So, yeah, number one, I would even put into just a simple start. You know, yeah. it's just about making baby steps and just working towards the goal that you want, not expecting that you're going to achieve this monumental success day one. You know, too often people are comparing themselves when they're just getting started to somebody that's been doing something for years and yeah. they expect to have that same outcome and they want to be just as good. I mean, that is just not realistic. So if we can accept where we're starting and accept that we're having the intention to develop, to be the person that we want to be, we can start basically stacking wins and building our self-confidence and giving ourselves the reward that we need to continue to build towards that person. So the biggest thing is just taking a look at your life and figuring out even just one thing that you can remove from your life to make it better. Right. I think we're going to, we're going to take a step back. So um, my, my podcast talks a lot about self-worthiness, um, losing yourself and finding yourself again, alongside it, um, some extension, existentialism crisis that I myself had and also perhaps other listeners that's on this podcast. So I would like to ask for you, have you ever had, have you ever had an experience of maybe personal loss or some traumatic event that actually um, perhaps pivoted you from where you were before in your life to where you are right now? So I would definitely say that my life has been a series of events that sort of brought me through a path that ended where I am. Awesome. And, and regardless <laughs> of how <laughs> good or bad those series of events may have been, I wouldn't change any of them because I am ultimately happy with where I am and the trajectory that I'm on now. But mm. I've not always been on this trajectory. So um, it depends on how far back you want me to go, you know, for time. example, my <laughs> first childhood memory was me in grade one, uh, interrupting my mother, having a conversation with her friend. And then I witnessed her having her first grand mal seizure, which I thought I had triggered and I thought she was dying. So I'm not sure if you're aware of what that experience looks like. Um, but no. <laughs> it, it's quite traumatic for a child to witness. And so from there, you know, I can go into, um, I had my biological father 
sort of leave when I was very young. I had a stepfather, you know, sort of taken uh, in his place years later who did not like children. And so, you know, there was developmental sort of situations that arose from there. Um, and then moving into, you know, later into my teens, um, of course, falling into lifestyle choices that would not be ideal for, you know, anyone <laughs> if I could choose them for them. Uh, and then those lifestyle choices sort of were exasperated when my mother passed in my early 20s. Uh, sure, and that would have been after about 16 years of fighting with brain tumors. So from that first moment through to there was, you know, sort of her, her quest. Um, and at that point, I sort of took the victim role, um, although I wouldn't have seen it at the time in that light, and basically severely abused alcohol and various other things um, for about a decade following that. And then sort of piece by piece, including from, you know, basically the, the dog development period uh, through to my current role, um, have been able to sort of manipulate, shed things, and redevelop myself to be the person that I am today. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being candid. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, prompt you beforehand that, that I would ask those questions. But Not thank you problem. so much for being for being for being open. Um. I wanted to ask you another question, but I think I'm going to co come back to it. Uh, okay, so you were saying about vices, about lifestyle choices, right? Why do you think people struggle with anxiety and depression these days? With what, sorry? Anxiety, anxiety and, depression? and depression, yeah. Uh, I think often both are a mixture of living in your past and wanting to control it and striving to control your future as well as basically a part of you telling you that you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing in your present. And mm -hmm. so I think too often we have these expectations that we can't meet and then we're not meeting the expectations that we should be. And then we end up usually diverting ourselves to distractions, which just magnify the problem and sort of store it and have it build for later. And I think the combination of all of those lead us to some very serious situations of both anxiety and depression, because we're not typically resolving our issues and we're not looking to develop past them, but instead to hide from them. So you said that you were um, you were in 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 that kind of um, maybe I would say lifestyle for about a decade. And would you say was it difficult for you to pull yourself out of it? Because I know uh, there are people out there that's they want to pull themselves out of it, but they just they just can't. They don't have the support or they just don't have that willpower, but they know they need to do something about it. So in your experience, how did you, I'm sure, yes, the answer is always yes, you can pull yourself out of it. But how did you do it? And how, what, what, what's your advice to those people out there? It could, I mean, it, it's not just limited to drinking or, you know, drugs or anything. It could be, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, it could it could be anything. Yeah, so. <laughs> so I mean, that's a, a heavily loaded question, but. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> uh, it was challenging at times. It was not um, a single trajectory that was just successful, and there were different stages that allowed me to shed different vices over the years. Mm. Um, now I would say that I was also going at it in like a blind manner for the most part. I didn't have guidance. I didn't have the support necessarily. Um, although I did have some support in my life, 
I didn't have anyone that was really uh, able to walk me through how a successful development could take place. So a lot mm. of it was sort of, I would view almost uh, like luck that I was able to achieve the the reforms that I was able to achieve at those times, and in many of the cases. Um, but for example, with the, the alcohol, when I did step away from that, I, I did go through a period of depression or what I would at least classify at it, as it. Um, and, and I would explain that is because I had basically just bottled up 10 years of emotion and 10 years of dealing with things. And then when I stopped drinking, it sort of just bubbled to the surface and I had to process it all at once. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times this will force people to just go right back to the bottle or whatever it is that they've been using to hide from their, their issues. Um, at the time, I didn't really have that luxury. I, I had other things that I was responsible for and I, I had focus. And so that focus and responsibility did help me carry through. Um, and it sort of pushed me to make it through. Now, from that point on until more present day, one of the consistencies has been um, fitness. You know, I, I think that moving the body and getting things sort of going in those moments elevates your frequency and brings you to a place that we need to be on a regular basis. So especially when you're in a low place, making sure that you're getting enough physical exertion to bring yourself out of it is almost in a literal sense that you are pushing the problems away, but in a sense that you're dealing with them rather than just hiding from them. Um, so that one did help straight through. And, and, you know, there's so many avenues nowadays that, that people can go to, you know, there, coaching is something that was not readily available, you know, a decade ago. This is something yeah. that is now, and there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of compassion and knowledge and the ability to help people fight through these struggles. So people don't have to do it alone anymore. Um, and then I'll also even go to nutrition, you know, because that is one of the focal points of my coaching program. Uh, I, I am very aware of how much that can help. You know, if you're eating like crap, you're going to feel like crap. And if crap. everything else in your life is in that same realm, you know, you're just compounding it more with the food that you're putting in your body. So, you know, it's basically looking to maximize your success on every single level. So developing the mindset, of course, is the fundamental one of all of them. But the fitness and nutrition enable us to really get to where we can and, you know, so things like meditating, reading, you know, journaling, uh, these can all be different avenues of getting our mindset and our body primed to have successful experiences with, you know, shedding these vices and developing back into a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing and answering those questions, even though that was a loaded one. Um, <laughs> so. I hear you saying meditation, journaling. Uh, do you do you do all these things? All those things besides fitness? Do. Yeah. <laughs> and I do on a daily basis. Right. So, you know, whereas for much of my life I would wake up and my day was subjected to my emotions that day. You know, if I woke Ooh. up sad, it could be a heavy day. If that I woke is, up angry, yeah. <laughs> it could be an angry day. And yeah. uh yeah. I, you know, have been fortunate enough to find this blueprint that I follow and it walks me through a daily routine that develops each day to be the best that it can be. And then if I find myself slipping at points, there are things that I do to bring myself back to where I want to be. And this, of course, is for myself, but also for everyone in my day, because I'm much more pleasant when I'm following this lifestyle on a regular <laughs> consistent basis. So, okay, since you touch on that, what does your day to day look like? Well, I wake up at 5am every day, 
regardless of how I feel or what's happening. Um, and then I go through a series of, you know, my, my morning routine, which does consist of, you know, meditation, journaling, reading, basically a process of getting everything moving, uh, and then a fitness regimen that I do once again every day with the exception of Sundays sometimes, but they're still substituted with something else that's very physical because I do think that it's just such a crucial part to our day. And in order to sort of make sure that every day is the best that it can be, I think that that's a portion of it that has to be involved. And then, so from there, it depends. I mean, I'm a full-time realtor and I do my lifestyle mindset coaching full-time as well. So it's a series of basically juggling that alongside with my my life. Um, you know, I have a fiance, a house, we, you know, mm-hmm. we stay active, we like to eat. Um, so, you know, just regular life stuff as well. Um, my bedtime is not depicted by anything other than when my day winds down and, you know, when I'm able to slash when I'm tired enough to go to bed. Um, it's the wake up time that's the essential part. And then, so even things like that, um, doing things that are difficult because waking up early for me is not a natural thing. This is something that I force myself to do, uh, for purpose, for an intention. And so not that that's the only one, but you know, the exercise, the waking up early, doing these challenging things intentionally so that we develop ourselves to be able to handle them so that when hard things come into our day, we can handle those with finesse. You know, we're, we're preparing ourselves when times are good for when the hard times do inevitably come. How important is sleep to you? <laughs> um, I, I feel that I sleep enough. So I, I, I'm sort of in the middle on that. I do think that okay. rest is important. I think that if I need it, I take it, uh, especially, you know, assuming I have the, the time and the ability to. Um, but I do think that there's other things that I prioritize over it at times. And I do so, think that, like, for example, when you're eating very clean and you're exercising regularly and you're keeping your energy up and your mindset is good, you're attracting and culminating energy. Whereas so often people are eating poorly, their mindset is poor, they're not exercising, they're, they're depleted of energy as it is. So the necessity for more rest is that much more crucial because they aren't harnessing their energy properly. So basically it's interrelated. While you eat, therefore, and you move, and therefore you get enough rest so the notion of seven to eight hours to you does not really apply 100 percent. it would i say that um can i say it depends on how you feel what your body yeah feel like like so it's like maybe six to seven but when you feel rested you'll be able to start your day just like that (laughs) and i used the example and you know it depends on the individual what the thing would be but there is always an abundance of energy inside of us. And so often, mm. if you look at some people, it might be like Christmas morning or going to <laughs> Disneyland. But if they know that they're doing that thing the next morning, they could sleep four or five hours and they are good to go. <laughs> and so, But it's not sustainable. <laughs> well, I mean, if they have things that are promoting that amount of energy on a regular basis, Mm. How sustainable would it be? And then, of course, work in the nutrition, the mindset, you know, and, and everything else. And then I think the the viewpoint starts to change. I think the factors influence the reality a lot more than people really take into consideration. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay, there's this one question here why looking good is not vain <laughs> you put this in in pod match i i i wonder why would you why would you put that out did, did anybody come to you and say oh since you're very very built very 
you know, you have the physique. Oh, oh he's now vain or she's now vain. But in truth, I mean, no, it's not. So what? What's your opinion on that? What's your take on that? Well, so I guess there's a couple layers to that. Number one, <laughs> I think that like the way that our eyes are developed, Mm -hmm. We are a physical being. We appreciate yes. beauty in a way that not every animal does. And I, I view it as a blessing. I love sunsets. I, you know, I, I appreciate the beauty of the world that we've been given. And so I think yeah. that inherently us looking our best is a natural state. Mm. You know, if we look at most animals in nature they look in their prime for the vast majority of their life. And then secondly to this, we feel best when we look best. And it's not necessarily because we look our best, but when we are in our healthiest state, we tend to look our best, we're glowing, our skin is radiant, and we feel the best inside. So everything always coincides. And you know, I'll have people throw out um, objections that, you know, they have friends that don't eat because, you know, these anorexia or bulimia, things like this, you know, basically mental disorders that are connected to the way they look. But this is not the same thing. I mean, that's an unhealthy version of somebody that has an idea in their mind as to what might look best and they're trying to attain it, but it's not health-based. Now you're getting mm. into more vanity, you know, mm. whereas when we're, we're perceiving it based on health, the two do tend to coincide in the sense that we do look our best, but it's not a, a trajectory of, you know, looking the biggest or looking the thinnest or it, you know, it's, it's about being your healthy self. And so everybody's physique is going to fluctuate, but I don't feel that it is vain in its natural state because it does inherently lead to us being our healthiest self. <laughs> okay. That was very diplomatic. <laughs> Thank you for covering that um, very delicately. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm gonna um, steer this towards a, a more, a question that is more, um, I guess, that touches the essence of my podcast. Okay, so can you share any personal experiences or stories of your, of self-discovery and how it positively impacted your sense of self-worth. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to, if you want me to break it down, there, there are actually two in, 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 in that question. So it's number one, can you share any um, personal experiences or stories of your own self-discovery journey? Okay, that's number one, yeah. So, I mean, I think that this has been one where, you know, it's been stages that have come through throughout my life. I would start, you know, in high school, I didn't even realize how closed off I was. I didn't realize the impacts that had sort of influenced my life and caused me to change my course in order to appease others. So um, one of the things that has been sort of that has come to my awareness more lately is that at various stages in my childhood, I lost my voice and I lost my voice because um, right back to that first situation that I mentioned with my mom, um, I was interrupting her when that ha happened. Uh, and as it proceeded, as I developed, uh, there were other stages in my life where I was basically shut down when I would talk too freely um, by people that were crucial in my in my you know surrounding. And so it wasn't until later that I recognized that the ability to share what it is that you feel and think is a gift 
And it was something that had been closed off in me for so many years. And I, I sought to basically avoid exposing my inner self to people out of, you know, basically fear of being shamed or shut down. Judged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is something that's very common in society as a whole. Um, and it's something that really took, um, well, even going on social media mm -hmm. and forcing myself through the discomfort of talking openly on camera <laughs> where oh, I yeah, had avoided you, photos <laughs> and video my entire life. Really? Wow. You've come a long way. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so that would be one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were saying. And then, so yeah, I mean, just allowing your true self to come out and flourish, um, regardless of the, the avenue. But that one has enabled me to sort of show myself in a more vulnerable state. And with the intention of sharing my my story, my experiences, both in the negative and what I've dealt with, as well as the positive and what's helped me in order to hopefully be able to give a path or shine a light on a path for other people to be able to sort of grow and develop um, and find, you know, a new lifestyle for themselves as, as well. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> you. You're doing good. <laughs> you do good Thank work. You. So what what keeps you up at night? <laughs> I sleep very well, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Second but, person that said that to me. Great, great. It seems yeah. like I'm choosing the right guest to be on my show. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Yeah, I mean, if you'd like to just know, like, the stresses that I carry mentally, is that more? Yeah, yeah. If you're open to, if, it, if you're open to share, I mean. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm open. I mean, you know, like I just touched on, I feel that by sharing these things, it helps other people know they're not alone. It helps other people know that there are, you know, others that they can reach out to, that they can connect with. And there's always, you know. Regardless of how well somebody is doing, there is always something in their life that yeah. can be developed further, you know? So my struggles are, are probably very similar to most, you know? I, I have uh, family struggles at times. Um, these are ones that, you know, I, I, I seek to balance. Um, yeah. I have, you know, the, the typical striving to excel in work mm. you know um yeah, i have, especially, I have that too <laughs> yeah because especially I have, when I have a, a passion which right. i assume yours is too you know like <laughs> it it weighs on you more when things don't go as you like because you know? it's significant so, yeah in our life yeah 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 you know, if you're working a nine to five job and you punch out at the end of the day, um, the job ends. Mm. I carry mine around with me always. And it's been like this with the dog, you know, breeding and training. And it is very much like this with the coaching. Uh, so learning to be able to keep a division between my client success and how I feel my success as a coach is going is one that is very challenging because I mm. see the best in all of my clients. I want them to achieve it, but I don't necessarily have the ability or influence to make that a reality. And so that's one that, that I struggle with because Although I can do everything that I'm physically, mentally, and emotionally capable of, I can offer them, uh, you know, whether it's compression or compassion, you know, which would be the equivalent to the correction and praise with my dog training. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> it, the reality is, is that not everybody is going to adhere to it. Not everybody mm -hmm. is ready to grow in the way that 
you know, they know they want it. That's why they reach out in the first place. There's a part mm. inside of them that recognizes, you know, this could be that path. This could get us to where we want to be, but not everybody's ready for it. And so my clients, for lack of a better term, failures or lack of adherence or, or lack of success at times uh, is probably one of my biggest struggles. <laughs> Oh gosh, thank you so much for being vulnerable, Steven. <laughs> okay, do you have a mantra that you live by? So I have throughout my life. Um, okay. My my original one used to just be uh, enjoyment of life, not at the expense of others. Enjoyment of life, not at the expense of others. Not at the expense of others, and so at. At surface level, this sounds very easy, but when you start to dissect it. Are you, yeah, are you like at the expense of yourself or is it just like you take, do you take the statement as it is enjoyment of yourself is not at the expense of others. So enjoyment of life, no, sorry. Right? enjoyment of life, not, enjoyment at, the of life, of not at the expense of others. So, so what is the enjoyment of life then? <laughs> I'd like well, to so break it down. <laughs> So enjoyment okay. of life at this stage, because that that has developed a lot, I used to have the perception of, you know, just having fun was one of the more valuable things in life. Mm. But as I've developed and matured and sort of my perspectives have shifted, I see that the enjoyment of life is really about being of service to others, treating yourself with the utmost respect, developing yourself to be the best person you can be, and ultimately living in a lifestyle that is basically healthy and love-based. And so, you know, that phrase can be manipulated in various ways or at least evolved in various ways to really change to um, a more pure sense, which is how I would perceive it nowadays. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so one last question. If you could have a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening and the world as your legacy, xxx-steven, Avon, what would it be? this one quote to leave with the world i mean um i've had people saying oh okay i've got one for now oh but then before we close this section they said oh i've got another one so i'll leave I it mean, to you <laughs> ultimately i think it's about you know tying into what i just said mm -hmm. is to live a life based in love and not fear put your hundred percent into everything that you do at all times with no expectations being held on the back yes, end. That's very good. Yeah, that's very good. And because... basically strive to be your best self and then share yourself with the world. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, those are very, we hear that all the time but it's just so sometimes so difficult for people to fathom or, or comprehend or even apply that to themselves but like you i also try to spread that message across through my podcast and i think that we made this is a very this has been a very very wonderful episode with you steven well, thank you I appreciate <laughs> I, yeah um i think we're good with time uh, usually my podcast is from 45 to one hour, but I think, I think I got the juice of it. I got to know your canine journey. I got to know how you train a canine, like that picture. I'm going to use that as the profile in my, um, my, 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 my social media. Um, that's a Rottweiler, right? Is that, was that a Rottweiler? That brown. Picture. You, you know, me? in, in. In Podmatch, there's a picture with you and a dog. You were wearing oh, glasses. No. Yeah. So that, um, okay. Yeah, that one's uh, an American double XL American bulldog. 
to a double leg cell, right? Can we... So that's actually a, a that, that can kill. Can can that kill? <laughs> he's a little lazy, that guy. He's physically he's very strong, but uh, okay. he, he wouldn't be my go-to if I was developing a protection dog. That's for sure. <laughs> Okay, sorry. So okay, I'm just gonna include this as like a bonus section. So the 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 dogs, right? Like I'm very curious. So you train these dogs, and these dogs, do they go to like CIA or the agencies or FBI? And then these are the dogs that they carry to, you know. <laughs> Maybe no, I watch so... too much American move, American show. So <laughs> I mean, that's out there. That's definitely out there. I did it okay. for families. Um, ah, so, so you're okay okay yeah i developed dogs straight from just obedience through to protection training but it was it was family based and so the purpose of this was that a family especially if they were sort of a high risk target type individual could Ooh, have really? their dog wow pardon? really oh okay. yeah so it's so like, like people of high okay, so high profile and then they yeah, have, you know, like uh, uh, I've worked okay, with NBA okay. players and uh, politicians, um, you know, police wow, officers. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I never so, thought I'd be talking to people like this, like yourself. Okay. <laughs> and so the okay. purpose was that this dog could be developed to be both a family companion and mm -hmm. also, you know, elite level protection dog that they could bring with them everywhere they go because the dog has to be good with children the general yeah. public and other animals, but they have been developed and trained. So it ties right back into everything else to be able to do what they may have to do if they ever are called upon. And so this is the same concept of training yourself or the dog to be capable of handling the most severe situations when things are good, so that if something does come about that, you know, is challenging in life, they can deal with it. And so it's the same about developing ourselves when times are good to be strong enough to deal with the hard times when they inevitably do come. And with the dogs, you know, most of the times it was enough of a deterrent just being present um, that it, it wasn't necessary, but, but they were <laughs> I think we tied up perfectly. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. I hope you have a Thank good you. day. Yeah, and um, I'll be Me tagging too. you when this episode airs. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you very you so much. much. I appreciate that. <laughs> take care. Thank you. Likewise. You take care too. Bye-bye.